random measure on this application. Okay. Thank you guys. Uh, thanks for the introduction. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about something maybe a little bit unfamiliar for physicists. Uh, it's a new construction done by my advisor and I. That's called, uh, it's a non complete version of Poisson random measure, basically. And we'll see how, it, we'll have, how the construction actually was. But the main point I want to, I want you guys to take home today is that we haven't actually done something mysterious or something that is uh, outrageous. What we have only, what we only did is to take a fresh look on the usual procedure of constructing quantum medical systems from one part of the systems. And that's what we, that's the only thing. Okay. So this is the basic outline of the talk, way too ambitious. Uh, so let's see how it goes. I'll, I'll provide, I'll spend uh, quite some time talking about motivations to convince you guys why this, this thing we are looking at is natural from the perspective of quantization. And I'll talk a bit about the details of the construction, mainly by examples, uh, simple examples, where calculation, explicit calculations are possible. And then I'll talk about uh, properties of uh, Poisson algebra, functorial properties in mathematical language. And if we have time, maybe we won't, maybe a little bit toy models about AQ, of AQFTs, and then something related to quantum informations. And the last part should not be here, <laughs> but it's still here, but uh, I'll have some comments on outlooks. Okay, so where do we start? Okay, uh, I'll always start with this comment by Nielsen, who said that first quantization is a mystery and second quantization is a functor. Well, I think in point five three, neither statements are mathematically accurate. Um, first quantization is certainly not a mystery. It's just not canonical. There are so many different approaches to first quantization. And second quantization, well, I hope after this talk, you guys will understand why second quantization is not one functor. You have two choices, at least. Um, so the goal here, like I said, is to convince the audience that there is an alternative choice other than the Gaussian functor. I'll, talk, I'll tell you what the Gaussian functor is. It's basically just a mathematical name of the second quantization we all know and love. Okay. So I'll start with the motivation part. I'll start with this little picture, okay? You have your classical mechanics, you have your classical field theory. You wanna produce some quantum things out of those systems. Well, classical mechanics uh, in some approaches can give you uh, descriptions of quantum mechanics description of uh, quantum one particle systems, I mean. And then on the side of classical field theory, some very ambitious projects uh, wanted to construct field theory in quantum sense directly from classical field theory. And the third arrow here from quantum mechanics to quantum field theory is the usual procedure. Usually we'll do this by uh, second quantization, the Gaussian function. So the talk mainly here would be in part three but I'll, I'll still spend time on one and two to give you some perspective, at least mathematical perspective. Okay, so this is num the, the num arrow number one from classical mechanics to quantum mechanics. Uh, what, are, what are the uh, mathematical approaches to achieve these steps? Well, I would like to split them up into two, two columns, two sides. You have your observables and you have your states. Now, observ observable sides, the main approach I would mention is the deformation quantization. You have your formal deformation quantization and you have your strict deformation quantization. But the input data is the is it, common to common to both approaches. It's a smooth it's smooth functions or functions on fossil manifolds. And the outcome in formal approach is a formal star associative algebra. This is largely due to Kontevich and collaborators. And in the strict case, obviously you have Riefel's work on strict C-style algebra quantization. And the outcome would be obviously a C-style algebra in that case. And on the state side, you have your geometric quantization. In this case, the input data, it's more complicated. It's not just the Poisson manifold. It's a Poisson manifold with some choices. Uh, you have to fix those data uh, in order to carry out the uh, geometric quantization. And outcome, uh, largely, uh, the focus mainly is on a is a Hilbert space of states. 
but there's a more uh, let's say unified approach, a proposed unified approach, which is due to Hawkins and his collaborators, which basically says that instead of just looking at a Poisson manifold, we should look at something called a symplectic groupoid uh, in the Poisson, uh, associated to the Poisson manifold. And this groupoid will produce a C-style algebra with a distinguished state. And this should be, this approach, it was argued that unifies those uh, uh, perspectives and the outcome would be an algebra with a state. Do you, do you really mean smooth functions, or is this like do you want them to be continuous? Do you want them to be like a bounded, measurable functions? Well, uh, let's let's okay. just say functions. Functions. Well, because I mean, do you, are are you after C star algebra or one dimensional algebra? Here, because I have to accommodate Mr. Kontsevich, uh, <laughs> I can't say I can put many analytic constraints on on, on the algebra I'm looking at. So I want to be very general. It's just that's just outlook. Yeah. Okay. Then there are ambitious guys that take that picture directly apply this to classical fields, and they want to come out with some quantum fields. Well, you still have your formal approach. That's still doable. In three fields, there's an attempt by Deutsch and Fred and Hagen and interacting fields. You have Hawkins and Bresner. Uh, these are just representative works. Many more works follows. But all of them are formal in the sense that they only produce formal associative algebra and they only produce a functional that doesn't really have a representation theory on it. By that, I meant you cannot really produce a Hilbert space out of that state, out of that function which is why it is formal instead of straight. And in the geometric side, obviously you have this famous success story by Witten and collaborators, which is the geometric quantization of uh, Chen Simons. But the key here is that actually, you're not dealing with something infinite dimensional at the end of the day. You're dealing with the moduli space of flat connections on VMR surface. And this moduli space miraculously it is both symplectic and finite dimension. So you are not doing, even though it is Chen Simon's theory, we usually think about it, oh, it's it's a really complicated theory, but at the end of the day, it's still finite dimensional, at least the classical solutions. Now jump over this slice. More, the most important perspective is that you see the famous story of 2D TFT. You have your equivalent, you're just, it's, you're, you're just looking at something called the community of Frobenius algebra an algebra. And what is Frobenius algebra? One way to look at it is that it's an algebra, it's associative algebra, it's, it has a star, and it has a state. There are no analytic, uh, analytic uh, requirements on this algebra. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a algebraic, purely algebraic thing. And then, of course, you have this these other approaches that, that's uh, from one of algebra perspective relates to Jones subfactor theory. The last slide, before I bore you to death, the last slide is multiple flavors of 2D CFT, which arguably is the most, uh, is the best understood example of any quantum field theory at this point. You have your vertex operator algebra, um, which is can be which can be understood as a direct axiomatization of operator operator product expansion, and representation representation of which. Um, basically, they're given by conformal blocks. And then, from the purely operate outward perspective, you have your chiral conformal net. Um, we'll have something to, to say about this later on, but this is largely done due to Longo and collaborators and a uh, very active area of research, which I might consider myself to be doing this work. And lastly, you have your uh, purely probabilistic perspective that. That say which just says that the conformal field theory should really just be the scaling limits of some underlying lattice theory. All of three are rigorous in some uh, in, in some cases can be made rigorous. Uh, I should say. So okay, I spent ten minutes in the in the introduction, which has nothing to do with with Poisson or whatever. But why this long introduction? What is the common common point that I try to stress? The, the common point I try to stress is that the natural, one of the natural outcomes of the quantizing classical system is that you, what you get is actually an algebra and a state. 
for a functional. Well, I, I'm, I'm deliberately vague here. Uh, algebra can mean different things to different people. It can be a C-style algebra. It can be a, just a purely associative algebra with no, uh, with no analytic requirements. But there is a state. What is state? Well, it can be. It can also be different things in different scenarios. It can be a uh, bounded functional for a C-style algebra. It can be just a uh, linear map to the underlying fields for an algebra. But the point is, you have an algebra and you have a state. And that's the natural outcome for uh, quantizing classical systems. So I'll pose this question to you. Why do we obsess over, over space? Um, I think I should move these questions to next slides. Um, so let's go on to the next slide. So before I ask that provocative questions that might anger some people, but let's first talk about arrow number three that goes from one particle system, quantum one particle system to many well, quantum many body system. And the traditional way is to go through the machinery of second operation. What do we do? Well, basically, we uh, take a Hilbert space, uh, to be more precise, we take a symplectic space and reproduce bio algebra by looking at the CCR relations. And then we look at its representation by quantum free states. That's basically what we do uh, in, this, uh, in, this, uh, uh, in this arrow. So heuristically, there are some problems already that we can talk about here. Um, the underlying data, the key data is the two-point functions. Uh, why? Because you're looking at the Hilbert space and the structures on the Hilbert space is the inner product. And the inner product takes in two vectors that spits out a number. Uh, uh, let me ask you a somewhat impossible task. I give you three vectors and you can you only use, the only structure you can use is the inner product. And you produce something that resembles a uh, connected piece of three-point function. Well, it's, it's, you can try, it, it's, it's really impossible uh, because the inner product, by definition, it takes the tensor product of uh, algebra with itself and spits out a, well, a number of whatever underlying field you're using. So the problem here we already can we can already see is that it's very difficult in this approach to go beyond quasi-free. So everything we produce at the end of the day has to be generalized free. And there's another problem which I mentioned here is uh, where, where where is chaos? If everything we produce is generalized free fields, in this strict mathematical approach, you know we can it's really difficult for us to talk about chaos in a rigorous way. So. Here's the more precise goal of today's talk, is go beyond the Gaussian functor. And how do we go beyond Gaussian functors? I would suggest let's talk about what I want to tell you guys about, quantization as an alternative approach to second quantization. So this is a uh, summary of what I just said. You have your symplectic vector field, sorry, symplectic, symplectic vector spaces over real numbers and produce one on algebra and you have your quasi free vacuum things. One way to formulate um, the Gaussian function. So here's the question. Well, I asked where is the, uh, uh, well, why obsess over a Hilbert space or why obsess over a vector space? Here you see, I asked another question from another perspective, where is the algebra? If the natural outcome of quantizing classical one particle systems is an algebra with a state, you should take in an algebra with a, a distinguished state and spit out something else. Now we take in a symplectic vector space. So in this story, if I'm asking this question, where naturally can we fit the algebra on this side? It, it's, it's not used. The algebra is not used. The only data we use is the vector space in the Gaussian vector. Okay, now I'm going to launch into the into the meat uh, of today's talk, uh, the construction of quasinization. And I'll comment on how all of these things were quote unquote fixed in, in the approach of quasinization. And the motivation I, 
I, the, the motivation I talk about should be um, should be understood in the following sense uh, that mm -hmm. I hope at the end of the talk you would find personalization natural, not in a rigorous sense, in a more colloquial sense. Okay. Well, huge, huge paragraph of words, which I said theorem, but it's just a summary of what personalization is before we launch into what it actually does. I'll just give you an outline of what personalization is. Well, personalization, well, it's a functor, just like the second, or just like the Gaussian, um, Gaussian functor. It's also a functor. But now we start with the category of what well, another algebra with a fixed normal semi finite weight. You don't have to, it's, it's, it's words. Well, normal algebra, I hope you guys all know or have an idea what they are, what is for unbounded linear functionals with nice properties. That's it. And you spit out the category outcome is also a one algebra, the category of one algebra. But now you have a normal phase four state. The linear algebra, the linear functional is bounded. Um, that's, let's just say that's what states are for that. Well, I, I told you what the objects are in the category. What are the morphisms? Well, the morphisms for that state just say they are normal star homomorphisms that preserve the functionals. Okay, preserve the weight, preserve the states. And this functor here is what we call what Morris and I call personalization. That's the outline. If you understand nothing, you should just this is a slogan. That's what that's what personalization does. Uh, could I ask one thing? Sure. This is a really nice question, but are you doing something so when you going from weight to state? Well, and whether it's losing something or gaining something, it's yeah. a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, well, they are they're, they're different in that sense. You're, you're right. Um, and this is this function is true for any someone in the world. Yes. Yes. Okay. Well. My advice more is we long had this construction, unpublished construction, where this side, uh, the Bonham algebra has lots of constraints and the weight has lots of constraints. And then he lost interest and then uh, throw the question at me or I throw the question at him. And then now it's general. General, Bonham algebra with any normal semi finite space or weight. Okay. I can even throw out the phase four, but things get messy. Okay. Actually, that's the that's the thing that confuses me. Yes, go ahead. On weights, right? There, yeah, you know, there will be finite on a part of the algebra, yeah, but yeah, they might blow yeah. up in some way. But you're saying that even though your weight is like that, yeah. you still end up with a faithful state. Yeah, it's also a faithful state. It's it's still faithful. So exponential math doesn't give that impression. Exponential minus. That's if if you want if you want that's a uh, renormalization factor in some sense. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's it's a it's space, or it's a state. Oh, that plus is just okay. Um, I th I talk so much without giving you any calculations. Let's look at one calculation. What's one random variable? It's the simplest we can get. What is a Poisson random variable with intensity lambda? Lambda is a positive real number, and it's it's a uh, it's a random variable. So here I wrote. Is a measure, it's a measurable function, but don't worry about it. It's just a random variable with value in natural numbers, right? And the probability of this Poisson random variable equals to n is given by this formula. Yeah. That's just, I mean, probability, uh, I don't know, probability one or one, one or two, one or three, basic probability. And let's recast the story of, uh, re recast Poisson random variable using the language of personalization. Just give you a flavor of how this personalization construction actually goes. So remember, the input is an algebra with a weight. What is the algebra here? Well, complex numbers, the simplest thing you can get. I mean, complex numbers is obviously a Bonneman algebra. <laughs> I mean, there's nothing to say here. What is the weight? Omega lambda, it's multiplication by the number lambda. Okay, obviously it's a, it's, it's a weight, I mean, it's a linear. It's a linear functional. Uh, it's but it's just multiplication. It's not normalized because omega, omega lambda of one is lambda. It's not necessarily necessarily one, and it's bounded. 
normal, which is the absolute value of lump. Well, uh, it's just lump in this case. Um, so what is the output of our personalization? I'll just tell you what it is. It's this, okay? Direct sum of symmetric tensor product n times of C, the algebra itself. That's it. That's the personality. Okay, then let's rewrite this. What is a tensor product of C with itself n times? It's still, it's still complex numbers. I mean, it's just multiplication. But it's direct, it's, it's isomorphic to C. Direct sum n times. What, what is the other name? What is another name of this algebra? Well, our infinity functions on the net natural numbers. Why? A Dirac delta function here, taking value one at the number of k, gives you 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0 sequence, one being at the k's position. And what is the Poisson state? As I told you guys, I will produce a state for you because Poissonization takes in an algebra, a weight, spits out an algebra in a state. Now, I told you what the algebra is. It's L infinity of n. Let me tell you what the state is. Well, it's the simplest thing you can ever think of. It's a summation of n, okay, one over n factorial, e to the power omega lambda acting on one, and then omega lambda tensor n times. Okay. So, n infinity are bound to these, but those plus are not, or what, why are the same? I don't know. Oh, oh, I, I should take the closure, but uh, um, uh, it's, uh, I, I, I'd rather not stress the point. The, the, the point is that this is the dense of algebra right here. This is the finally support. These are the finally supported functions on natural numbers. Because they're sequence, right? And it's a direct yeah, sum. Those are bounded or not? The, the sum is bounded or okay. the... This is, yeah, this is the bounded function, so that. But the other, the plus is just arbitrary sequence or not? Sorry, this is this is not this is not this is a direct sum. So you can only take finally there are only finite many non-zero elements. Oh, ah, okay. So I should take the closure okay. to, to 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 go to that side. But uh, I don't. Yeah, I don't. I don't really want to stress that point. But anyway, um, this still makes sense. Omega lambda tensor n. Well, each piece, each n piece here is omega lambda tensor n, right? And then the sum is just mean just means that you know I have I, I need to tell you how it acts on each of the ends and ends each of the ends piece. So that's what you get. That's the puzzle state. Okay, let's do a calculation. Because I gave you the definition of puzzle state, I didn't tell you how to calculate it. Uh, let's do a calculation. Okay, let's look at direct delta function. That direct delta function. That is one at n and zero elsewhere. Well, elsewhere. This is how you represent this function uh, in L infinity n. How you represent it in a uh, in the direct sum language? Well, it's zero zero everywhere one at the n's piece. Well, one at the n's piece is that. You plug it in. You plug in the formula. You get this. I mean, it, it's it's just plugging omega lambda tensor n acting on one tensor n is lambda to the power n. Well, what's that? That's the probability of Poisson random variable taking value at n. <clears throat> okay. Well, let's see another side of the story. Just summarize what we have learned. Look at the characteristic function of Poisson distribution. That's the characteristic function of Poisson distribution. And can we reproduce it by Poisson state? Yes, we can. We just look at this unitary operator in our bond number output. Plug it in, you get this. Well, there it is. What is tensor n in the left hand side of pi? Oh, uh, I'm looking at this picture. So yeah. each each of the n's piece is e to the power i t, I t tensor n, yeah. and you have you collect all of them. All, all of them. Should we just scroll down? Uh, the right hand side doesn't have an n. Doesn't have an n. Oh, the right hand side doesn't have an n. 
I mean, I, I, I already summed about it. The state summed about it. Oh, I see. That, that is, I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah that, that, it's, 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 yeah, formal notation, yes. Notation. But yeah, a good point. This is this is this is a formal notation. There's a way to make it rigorous, but uh, formal 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 way to write it is more uh, illuminating in this case. Okay, I give you the story on the simplest one algebra, complex numbers with a weight. Now let's just directly generalize this one to. Okay, I chose to I, I chose a difficult job for myself. Um, I, I directly generalize this to any one of algebra with a normal faithful state. Okay, you can do the same thing. The only requirement is that here is that the state is the the omega here is finite. Uh, it doesn't have to have to be normalized, but uh, let's say it's normal. You can do the same thing. You produce the symmetric tensor product again. Closure. Uh, we need to take that, but let's just not worry about them. Here it is. That's the Poisson algebra. Here is the Poisson state. This looks very innocent. The demo here is in definition of the Poisson state. Um, that's how you get the key of the construction. Now. Maybe we can say some words, how do we go beyond uh, states, right? I told you this, the input of a Poisson functor is one of my algebra with any weight. Uh, does it have to be a state? Does it have to be bounded? So how do we go beyond a state? Now it's, ne it's, it's necessary to introduce, well, in, in the work we do, we have three equivalent constructions. But for now, let's just mention two approaches. There is a group perspective and there is a Lie algebra perspective. So if you want an integrated approach and an independent approach. Now, um, there, there, there are two objects uh, I have to define. So give me a weight, uh, a rule of semi-finite phase for weight on one of algebra. I can define the algebra of analytic elements, good, nice elements. Uh, it's called the Tomita algebra. It's a star associative algebra. Not too little, um, most likely not including one. Um, and I can def give you something called a definition ideal. S things that are finite under the weight. And we look at a pretty odd object. Uh, we look at this little set, analytic elements, norm less than one, so in the unit ball. And x minus one is in the definition ideal. I made, an, I made another mistake here. Let's require x to be uh, invertible. So um, in this case, this set is actually a group. It's a little observation. That's it. That's how you see it's a, it's a, it's, a, it's a actually a, a group. One is obviously inside this set because one minus one is less zero. So we took this. Now we produce some operators. We took out let's say this set for this group. We add our little gamma on it. Sorry, uh, wrong thing. They produce a bounded operators on this over space. But this is an operator. Um, I should write B about to also uh, here. And this map is a group homomorphism, which means gamma of x, y is gamma times uh, gamma of x times gamma of y. And the claim here is that gamma x generates the Poisson algebra. If you do this exercise back to the state case, you get the same thing that we, we just talked about, the direct sum of uh, symmetric tensor products. I swept under the rug the construction of L2 um, because I, I need to have this Hilbert space first, then I can talk about operators on this Hilbert space. This thing is constructed by a limiting argument, or you can construct it by a limiting argument. Uh, I, I, won't, I won't go into the details here. But the key thing, the key, key, key takeaway here, perhaps, is this formula. Your, your, your Poisson, you define a state, a Poisson state, 
acting on your gamma x, you have this formula. Now you see why x minus one needs to be finite. Otherwise, omega x minus one is infinite. It has, doesn't have a mean. So we need to look at this. What is this? It's just an analog of Poisson, the characteristic function of Poisson distribution. I said here, gamma x is the analog of vial operators, but perhaps I think it's more it's it's more helpful for us to come back to this point uh, when we talk about the infinitesimal uh, approach. Is there a simple uh, multiplication rule for gamma of x? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right now? That's why I said uh, gamma is a group. Of... Oh, wow. But given x, y are both inside this 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 uh, this group. This group. Oh, but the addition is part. Oh yeah, addition is hard. Oh, it's, addition. But it's like it's just common. Yeah, common it's it's common for it. You take the you take the infinitesimal approach. Addition becomes easy. Multiplication becomes hard. Yeah, this this is really analog of the while. That's why it's, it's very it's a, simple. That's that's why it's an analog of while. Well, I have a basic question. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Um, can you go back to the previous one? Yeah, sure. Um. So I got confused with uh, the definition idea. Oh yeah, definition ideal. Uh, omega uh, m of omega is x inside n. Omega. Oh, let, let me let me for, for my for my for my benefit. Let me define two things: a left ideal and a right ideal. Fine. Yeah, this yeah. is fine. This is n. This is not n. Then what is m? Uh -huh. m. You can split into a finite sum. X i star i, where x i z i is in your left idea. Okay, I see. I see. Yeah. For my benefit, I took the took the. Perhaps more treacherous route. Yeah. And how, how does it relate to the formula algebra? Is it something different? No, no, no. They, they, they're they different, but they're related. They, they are related, but let's not get okay, it. Okay, okay, yeah, fine. But, yeah, okay, that's okay. Because formula algebra is nice elements, analytic. Or they will, if you talk about functions, they would literally be analytic functions in some cases. Um, yeah. An analogy here. Comparing to the second quantization. Yes. Uh, in second quantization, I guess the what, what I'm trying to understand is that if your water particle algebra is a billion, yes. In this case, yes. Does that lead to some sort of a simplification that makes it more manageable? Because that oh. it's a second quantization, we're dealing with something a billion. If we do the covariant quantization, if uh, we okay. do the uh, if we do the canonical quantization, then we're making not a million. Well, I guess I haven't really thought about this problem to be honest, but because I'm working, I, I tend to work That's in something problem. generally. Yeah. But uh, um, yeah, it's a good question. Probably it reproduce stochastic integrals. That's my guess. Um, okay, yeah, infinitesimal approach. Like I said, Tomita algebras, which we used, um, uh, which we will use, is an associative algebra. An associative algebra is a Lie algebra. I mean, x times y minus y times x, that's your Lie. Okay. And given your Lie algebra, I can always do one thing. I form its universal enveloping algebra. I mean, there's nothing to it. And, it, and this map here is a Lie algebra homomorphism. It takes you from your Lie algebra to your universal enveloping algebra. And the way to understand this map here in this context is that it is an infinitesimal approach, sorry, infinitesimal counterpart of your quantization, of your Poisson quantization. Well, obviously, it pre pre preserves commutativity because it's a Lie algebra homomorphism. By definition, Lie bracket is preserved. It has a ramification later on when we talk about locality uh, in AQFT, but we'll probably come back to this point. And elements in your universal enveloping algebra 
by, okay, I think Peter Burrell, Bao, probably, uh, PBW basis. You can write them, uh, you can write them out uh, as such. X1, X2, X up to Xn, they're all elements in your total power code. It's a formal thing, it's a formal thing, but you can always write this formal thing there. And it's a vector in your uh, in your uh, universal enveloping algebra. Why do I mention this? Well, let's first look at how I, I can still talk about. I can still define something like. Well, uh, let me let me backtrack a little bit. The goal here is that I have now something abstract, an abstract Lie algebra called the universal enveloping algebra of the Tommy algebra. Very lengthy thing to say. The end goal here is that use that algebra to produce me a Hilbert space. The way to do it is to define it, to define a free, uh, free Hilbert space structure using a formula. And this formula is done by this. It's a combinatorial formula. I won't tell you what, where it comes from. I just throw it out here. But it has an origin just by taking, taking derivative of the characteristic function of Poisson distribution, you will get this. What is the sum? Sum over partitions, all partitions, okay? All partitions of n, the set one, two, three, n, n. all partitions. And capital A is a subset inside this partition because partition, what you do in partition, you partition your, uh, you, you pop your set one to n up into little subsets. A is just one of those little subsets. And you take the product. Why the arrow? Well, we're talking about some non commutative Arrow just means ordered product. What's the ordering? I mean, ordering is just the usual ordering of natural numbers. I'm ordering the subscripts. So let me write down an example. Let's say n equals to four. Okay. Uh, let, 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 me, let, <laughs> let me spare myself. The pain of writing down stuff. Let's say n equals to three. Three. Uh, how, how how you partition one to three? All possible partitions. Well, you have one, two, three. You have one, two, three, and blah blah blah. And then you have what else do you have? Well, you have nothing. That's it. So let's just try them out. Two, one, three, and then three, one, two. Then how do I write down the formula for n equals to three? P omega, lambda x1, lambda x2, lambda x3 is a sum of omega x1, x2, x3, plus omega x1, omega x2, x3, plus omega of x2, omega of x1, x3, plus omega of x3, omega x1, x2. That's it. Well, what about the partitioning the root, like each single one? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. sorry. Okay. Um, yeah. yeah, that's it. Uh, induction to all n, not induction, uh, generalized to all n. Okay. And Why you, do I have a. So, yeah, go ahead. Uh, just to make sure. So this gives you complex. Yes, because uh, wait, 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 wait. And all of them are in the atomic algebra, so they're all like that. Is there some sort of like a, I'm thinking of these operators inside the uh, box space of the second quantize. I'll go to box space. But I'm just, yeah. maybe, maybe this is you're really talking about this. But there's a unitary bubble of transformation. I'll give you a very explicit. I mean, I don't think you can go any explicit than that, but I'll give you an explicit formula to go back and forth, come with for a formula. Okay, why do I have a uh, three Hilbert space structures? I'll, I have this growth condition. Okay. 
judging from the time, we won't have time to talk about chaos, but uh, stare at this growth condition. Well, uh, people in grill of complexity talks about this uh, quite extensively. This is the upper bound of your operator growth. They should grow with this power, e to the power n, n to the power n. Another uh, one other co comment here for uh, for mathematicians here is that this growth condition comes from the classical hamburgers moments problem, and this is a version of non commutative hamburgers moments problem, and that problem is solved by my advisor and Marius. and that's how we can get that all these constructions we have, however we want to do it, they're equivalent. Wait, is this some sort of like in the uh... The, the, this has some sort of implications in the Fourier space for in terms of regularity, right? The Fourier transform. That's, for, I mean, Fourier transform. Uh, so I'm, I'm still thinking of the one part of the Fourier space. Okay. Maybe, maybe we'll talk about it. <clears throat> yeah, All the examples in my head is just second like quantization of ah, materials. Fourier transform. Well, it's not it should, it should, it it's it not should. It should. anymore. It should. So then, then the observation is that. When x is self adjoint, lambda x, it turns out, well, it turns out to be an essentially self adjoint operator. Then we can do, well, Mr. Stone told, uh, told us to, uh, 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 to, to cons cons consider the unitary, one parameter unitary group generated by lambda x. And the key formula here is that this equation holds. And if you if you love second quantization in second quantization you also have this file operator generated by something it's a sum of creation and annihilation operator in second quantization case if this equation holds your your representation of ccr is regular otherwise it's irregular representation we only care about regular representation otherwise you don't have infinitesimal generators basics we have three different types of bases. The first one we already see, that comes from the universal enveloping algebra. You have two other types. Let's just stare at them. I'll have some comments in the next slides. It's very complicated, but I, this slide is here to convince you that this is a combinatorial formula that you can use back and forth in whatever way you want. Why? Initial conditions, initial conditions. This formula only involves things that has less than n terms. This is n, n minus one terms, n minus one terms, less than n terms. So it's a it's an inductive definition of these uh, of bases. I didn't tell you how I get these. I didn't pull it out of hat, out of hat. Um, here's the reason. Well, we already know the first type comes from universal enveloping algebra. How do I get the second type? That's a different model of Poisson algebra that I don't want to tell you about. It's given by an ultra product construction. That's how I get the second type. And from second to third type, it's nothing but the classical cumulants and moments formula. I go from cumulants to moments, and I go back and, and I can go from moment to cumulants. Now, why do I talk about these um, bases? The first basis is natural from the constructive perspective. The second basis, it's a tool because I want to get to the third basis. Because in the third basis, this formula holds. Now let's stare at it. What does it say? It says that this inner product factorizes into two point functions. What does that mean? That just means, okay, the Hilbert space we're working on is nothing but the Fox space. So the L2 of the Poisson algebra, the GNS Hilbert space, is isomorphic to the Fox space. And the Fox space, the underlying, well, Fox space is always Fox space of some other Hilbert space, right? Because you want to talk about direct sum of symmetric tensor products of H. And this underlying H, is the L2M using the weight omega. But the key point here is that the algebras are different. The Poisson algebra is not the bio algebra. 
the plus and algebra sits inside B uh, bounded operators on the symmetric functions. That's maybe uh, another key takeaway today that I'm not working on some strange Hilbert space. I'm only working on symmetric tensor products. I'm only working on symmetric box spaces. I'm just work working with a different algebra. Okay, now the question is, how do I see the connection somehow? I'm not claiming that I, I, I see the connection. I have presented full connections. One way to see the connection is to calculate how the generators of some of those um, Poisson operators act on a basis. Well, this is how it acts. It's so complicated, right? Let's break it down. I have my creation piece, which goes from grading, uh, grading n to grading n, by n plus one. I have my uh, annihilation piece, which goes from grading n to grading n minus one, because I pulled out one of the yi's. And I have things that preserves grading. I multiply with a number. I multiply with x inside. So compare with the vial operator, the generators for, for vial operators. What do we have? Vial operators, they are creation and annihilation. You go from n to n plus one by creation. You go from n to n minus one by annihilation. We still have these two pieces, but we have something else. That's it. There's no magic to it. Very explicit. But the claim here is that lambda x generates a different algebra, which is the Poisson algebra. Okay, that's it. Okay, I'll very quickly talk about the properties. Go ahead. Uh, can, the, that that could be turned into some sort of explicit unitary rotation of basis, right? So this the is rotation of basis is going by these three formulas. You go back from this lambda empty empty basis to lambda empty, go back to the lambda basis. All of those will be given by some upper triangular matrix. Right. So what I, the reason I ask this is that the analog of the field operator in this formulation is this lambda of x. Yeah. And this unitary rotation is some sort of a basis chain. Uh, yeah. The question that remains is that does this basis chain respect locality, right? Are ah. these lambda x's local fields or are they some sort of uh, non local. Well, we'll, we'll, perhaps maybe we'll come back to it. Yeah. I don't know if this is or not, but if the Poisson thing, Poisson thing is the thing that the family we call coherent state. Coherent state is given by bio operators. It's uh, the, e, e, e to the lambda a dagger. It's not, it's not, it's not coherent state. This is not that. It, it looks very similar though, It's but it's not. Lambda zero zeros are quite coherent. Lambda empty empty are the basis of yeah. the fox space. Yeah, it's like they're uh, yeah, 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 yeah. And the photons is yeah. lambda empty. Yeah. Okay, let me very quickly talk about the properties, why we care about quantization, or maybe perhaps why all of us should care. Um quantum channels. What are quantum channels? Unitary completely positive maps. If a quantum channel from one particle Hilbert's one particle algebra to another one particle algebra that satisfy this condition, well, I have to have uh, make them satisfy well, respect my weights. Then I can link the quantum channel to another quantum channel on my Poisson algebra given by this formula. Obviously, uh, normal star homomorphisms they are quantum channels, quite trivial ones. So homomorphisms, I can let them as well. So modular homomorphisms are homomorphisms, I can let them. And the observation here is that the lifted, lifted modular automorphisms is the automorphic modular automorphism of the Poisson state. So if you ever care about designing or want some nice properties to hold for a modular automorphisms on a very huge algebra, that's the way you do it. You do it on small algebra, fix it, lift it, you automatically get something you want. 
And that's true for omega and omega and both. Sorry. What for both? Uh so omega you have omega n and omega n, right? Oh, this is all one algebra. Uh so here stigma t acts on its own. So 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 right, yeah. Right. Yeah, so so that t so that t intertwines between two different algebras. Modern automorphism groups map the algebra to itself. Yeah, but the gamma will map sigma to plus on. Sorry, I think I. So gamma goes from. Oh, let's, uh, let's, I think you're asking gamma is something that goes from something like n to your plus on algebra. So what I'm saying right, is that right, right. now you can do this. Yeah. And you can do this. Right, okay, okay. Okay. Yeah. So that lifting is true for and then and for Yeah. Okay, in that respect, yes. Okay. Now some collection of results. Well, if my over space L2 is is um separable, Poisson of E of L2 given by the weight given by the trace. Is D hyperfinite to one factor? And so, so say it again. If your D of L2 is se separable? L2, if L2 is separable. Oh, sorry, uh, L2 is separable. Then this Poisson and then, then this Poisson algebra is hyperfinite. So why would yeah, I thought in physics that would be the only case we've ever considered. No, I'm just mentioning it. I mean, maybe you care about non-separable over space at some point. No, I'm just saying that in physics right. we usually don't. Yeah, anyway. I agree. But 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 you always get a hyperfinite type two one the plus on algebra in the bottom. You use the trace, that's what you get. Oh trace. <laughs> yeah. That's the devil. <laughs> um okay, what else? Locality. I don't have time to talk about locality, but this is one manifestation of locality. If I have a projection in my centralized. Okay, what is centralized? Things that does not move under modular automorphism groups. If I have a projection under centralizer, I can split my Poisson algebra up with the tensor product, and then it is, oh, <laughs> uh, well, here, here, here. I can split my Poisson algebra up. The tensor product is the subalgebra generated by those pieces. Somebody would call it split. Uh, I would refrain from using that language. L2 always split, okay? L2, you always have this tensor product equal to the whole piece. Why? All three Hilbert space you see in this equation 19 are Fox space. That's true for Fox space. That's true for L2 of Poisson algebra because they're the same. But on the algebra side, well, unfortunately, you don't get everything in general. There are situations that you get everything, but in general, you don't have this isomorphism. But nice thing is, Takizaki tells us that I have conditional expectation from the largest piece to the small piece generated by local stuff. So when we use it, you should always think about the projection E as given you as restricting the large algebra to a local piece. Why? Think about your favorite manifold and you have uh, some kind of flow on your manifold. And the flow doesn't take you everywhere. In some regions, the flow is just flowing within itself. And if the flow is D modular automorphism group acting on our infinity of functions on the, on the manifold, projections in the centralizers is nothing but projections selecting the local regions where the flow is local, where the flow does not flow away outside that region. That's in that in this sense, in this very heuristic sense, in this very heuristic picture, you should think about this E as selecting a local region. We'll come back to I don't have time. Maybe when, when I when I answer questions, but I'll come back to make this point precise. I'll skip AQFT um, for now. Let's jump to relative entropies. Okay. There is this question, oh, by the way. 
Um, I showed you how to construct type two one factors. So you can ask, oh, you only get type two factors or can you get something else? I can get type three, type three one, type three lambda, anything you want by hand using force validation. So now this question becomes that, how do I calculate relative entropy or other quantum information quantities in let's say a type three Borderman algebra? Well, it's not trivial. Uh, I mean, if, it, if it's trivial, I already know how to do this, but it's not trivial. In some cases, in the Poisson algebra, we know how to do them, how to do it. This is one way, to, uh, this is one calculation, uh, arguably the key calculation, that tells you how to calculate relative entropy. How do we do it? We cannot do it in general. I need, first of all, I need two weights, right? Relative entropy is relative entropy between two functionals. Two states, two weights, so I need two weights. And I need a condition, one condition, okay? One weight needs to be a bounded perturbation of the other. That's how I say it. Okay. One needs to be the bounded perturbation of the other. So the difference is always bounded above. Uh, it's not always finite. It's not infinite. Okay. In this case, relative entropy calculation is, in some sense, for free because I have two Poisson states. The they are states on your Poisson algebra that <laughs> potentially is type three. And I calculate the relative entropy it equals to the relative entropy of these two weights with this correction term. So if you know on um, the little algebra n how to calculate relative entropy, you know how to calculate the relative entropy in the Poisson algebra. It's what we call preservation of relative entropy in the case of Poissonization. And this right-hand side, I didn't put it out of hat either. Lingblad already looked at it. He called it Lingblad theorem, or we call it Lingblad's entropy. <laughs> I mean, why why does he include this term? It's just for normalization. Iraqi and people only look at the case where omega one, omega two are states are normalized. When it's not normalized, you need to add this piece so that this whole thing is still not negative. That's the only reason why Mr. Iraqi, Mr. Lingblad, look at this piece. We we look at the same thing. So the more precise statement here is that the link blocks relative entropy is preserved by Poissonization. And that's how we do it. Basically, I'm just telling you that you can also lift Kahn's co cycle to another co cycle. That's the lesson here. Okay, uh, I don't, I, officially I don't have time for this, but let me, let me end um, by saying that um, the goal here, the, the whole goal of this talk is not to give you concrete constructions of examples. It's to convince you guys that when you quantize, when you quantize one part of the system to many body system, perhaps you don't have to always use the Gaussian functors, which relies on, which can only produce quasi free states in physical situations. Perhaps it's, Another choice is to use Poissonization to do uh, to achieve the same goal, to give you another algebra that is not the bio algebra, but acts on the same Hilbert space. That's it. That's the end of my talk. Question? I think this is a thing that you didn't talk because yep. of the time constraint, but I want to know the generic recipe of how you construct uh, an open algebra here. Like what's the input? Sure. Yeah. Uh, this is a stupid example. Input here is I give this example. This is just one example, okay? um, but it somehow has a geometric flavor to it. I use parabolic induction. Oh, sorry. Let me say what is the input? Input is Unitary representation, principal series unitary representation of any real semi simple EV. That's it. Think about what Mr. Weinberg did. Weinberg told us that one particle, how do we get one particle of Hilbert space? It's a representation of Poincare. That's what I'm telling you. That's my input, although I'm generalizing it to any real semi simple EV. But I'm restricting the representation here to principal series representations. But in a very real sense, they're almost all representations, apart from discrete series representations. So the procedure I use here, you need to use some kind of procedure. Just how to how 
let's just ask ourselves the question, how do I get principal series representation? One way, you use parabolic induction. Go from a representation of a smaller subgroup to the group itself. That's what parabolic induction is. So I use the construction of um, that unitary representation. I produce a Hilbert space, so, sorry, I produce a Poisson algebra. I skip this side. Mm -hmm. I should have skipped that side. I, put, I can produce a Poisson algebra. I can calculate actually what type, what type of Poisson algebra I have. Sometimes if I have, if I start with one single piece of irreducible representation, I only get type two one in this construction. If I start with two piece and the roots, well, roots in the sense of the algebra, if these two roots are generic, I get type three lambda. If I have three piece or more and they're in generic positions, I get type three one. These are all done by, by calculating by hand what the con spectrum is. Oh. Now let's fix my Poisson algebra. I somehow, that procedure I just told you about, I somehow rolled back the, the parabolic induction. Now I do it another way. I do, a, I do a parabolic induction on my Poisson algebra. I can consider something like this. P is a parabolic subgroup. That's how you get your uh, uh, unitary representation. Now I look at P of L2 of this quotient space. Mm -hmm. There's something iffy here. You need to use half densities, but let's not talk about this. And you need tensor product. This is type 3, 1. I'm looking at the D of L2. Absorbs. Mm -hmm. It's a factor, by the way. You have this. Mm -hmm. What I'm saying, then how you get, how do you get local piece? In this very silly example, look at this algebra, any open set you want, you can restrict them. You get your local algebra. You take the corner of your B of L2. You still have the type 3, 1, 1 algebra and still uh, isomorphic to itself. Mm -hmm. But you have, what does this set, what does this set of 1 algebra satisfy? Couple of things. Isotony, it ad admits strong, con strongly continuous group action by a group G, the original group. And the set of A of O is covariant under this group action. You have an existence of G invariant state. Mm -hmm. And this is given by your Poisson state. And you have locality. In what sense? In the sense that two separate regions digital commute. So, uh, so sorry, I got confused. What's the G in the construction? G is the group, the original group. The original semi-simple group. Yeah, the original semi-simple group. Okay. Let's see. That G. Uh -huh. okay. the, the, the tricky part of all of these construction is that the Poissonization, the input of Poissonization picks a weight. So that weight probably is not invariant in the group action. How do you deal with that is the problem. There are two ways. In the principle, in this stupid example I gave, I use induction because the parabolic subgroup preserves the weight. So I can lift that group action, no problem. Then I do induction. Mm -hmm. Then I get everything. For discrete series representations, I can do another thing, which I don't want to talk about. But basically the outcome is that I can choose by hand a half sided modular inclusion. Because in that case, there is always a, an AX plus B group shown somewhere inside. There is a weight scaling action. And a weight scaling action is, well, let's say it has some spectrum that's positive, so I can take, and take the log. Then I get back my, my beloved Eisenberg group. Mm -hmm. That's what Longo did. I just followed his footstep, generalized it to discrete series representations of real semi simple E group. But that's, that's this stupid example. But if you want to take away any lessons, it's that there is, there is a result which haven't been published. It's not even in the manuscript, which says that if you take projections in the centralizer, you remember centralizers of the original article. If you 
take a family of projections uh, in the centralizer. You look at the projection and you look at the Poisson constructions such as this. You look at the family of those things, they form a sheaf in a mathematical sense. Hmm. It's an actually a sheaf. The conformal net we usually talk about, they're not a sheaf. They're a pre <laughs> they're a pre co sheaf. They're not sheep. What's the, what's the problem? You cannot glue things. I'm telling you, in my in this Poisson construction, you can glue things. You can glue local data to global data. That's what I'm telling you. And that gives you considerable, let's say, freedom to construct examples. You can make your example as geometric as you want. Because sheaf is just a fancy way to say, I have a not so nice facts upon them. <laughs> That's it. You might as well have already defined any of all. Yep. Yeah. So with hard, hard support, so all is now a, what is this I think this was a key part. Sorry. Well, I did the stupid thing. Oh, that, that's what we do in second quantization as well. Okay, I see. I took the local region, I pencil the Poisson, Poisson things. Yeah. I want the Poisson to be type three so that it can absorb the B of L2. Right. But, I mean, I'm restricting to a subset. So isotony yeah. is satisfied. Yeah. Right, right. And also you can do, you can, you, I, I'm, I'm not saying this is the only choice. You can do a lot of things. You can look at L infinity. You can look at L infinity. O, cross product, whatever group action you want. Sure. Tensor P. Uh, yeah, that, that, that is what we'll do. We will do it like second conversation. Of course. Yeah. As, as you can, you can, you can, Morris yeah. like this pseudo differential operators with value in P. I don't know how to do this, so I leave it out. But uh, you can also do this. And the nice thing is that if you have this, you can look at the Xenia trace, and there are papers telling you how to con construct Einstein Hilbert's action using the Xenia trace. Yeah, I'll, I'll leave it out. I have a comment to make about that, but that's later. All right, any other question? Not plus thank you, Ani. Yeah. So this is what these these gamma uh, f that you're defining. These guys acting on your action today create a set of states. These are not coherent states. These are not positive states. Yeah. But their relative entropies have this nice formula yeah. coming from the one particle holding space. Yes, yes. Same, same is true for normal coherent states. So the relative entropy of coherent states, if you want to calculate them uh, in the box space, is given by the relative entropy can, or it comes from some sort of a modular theory you construct for linear subspaces 